Good afternoon, and welcome to the second RSNA 3D Printing Special Interest Group's webinar of the year. I am Peter Leocoris, the current SIG Chair, and I will be moderating today's webinar along with Andy Christensen, our current SIG Secretary. Before we get started, for those of you who may not know, RSNA is the Radiolog Radiologic Society of North America. The mission of RSNA is to promote excellence in patient care and health care delivery through education and technological innovations. RSNA has over 52,000 members from over 153 countries around the globe. Within RSNA, we have the 3D Printing Special Interest Group. This group was founded by Dr. Frank Lubicki in 2016 after three successful years of educational and hands-on sessions at the annual RSNA conference. The SIG's mission is to promote the highest quality 3D printing applied to medicine via education, collaboration, and research. The SIG will the SIG will focus on maintaining a prominent role for radiologists in this diverse and growing specialty. The group will also seek to provide physicians and allied health scientists with optimized education and research. Please visit the RSNA website if you would like to become a member of the RSNA and SIG community. I am happy to say the SIG is in its fifth year and still making contributions to the field of medical 3D printing. Over the years, the SIG and SIG's members have been part of major efforts throughout the community. These efforts include publications on medical 3D printing guidelines and appropriateness for clinical scenarios, a joint meeting with the FDA, Category 3 codes, medical 3D printing registry, along with having active work groups for quality assurance, regulatory, and education. While we continue to deal with COVID-19 and an abundance of information online at point of care facilities, we need to know what resources are available to our, to our facilities and how to successfully navigate and utilize these resources. Today's webinar will focus on COVID-19 and 3D printing collaborations. The RSNA is extremely grateful to our panelists who have taken the time out of their busy schedules to educate us on their collaborative efforts. I will now turn it over to Andy Christensen who will explain the premise of this webinar. Thanks, Pete. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, now on to today's topic, COVID-19 and 3D printing collaboration. Uh, as, as Pete mentioned, we're uh, pulling together today uh, the FDA, the Department of Veterans Affairs, uh, Innovation Ecosystem, uh, the NIH 3D Print Exchange, and America Makes, uh, who have entered into an agreement to share data and coordinate on open source medical products for COVID-19. Um, the panel will be comprised of one representative from each institution uh, to discuss why and how the collaboration was created, the ongoing efforts, and future goals. We're given the the uh, relation of the SIG and, and what we uh, what we are here for, the emphasis will be placed on 3D printing in hospitals and how these facilities can navigate and utilize this collaboration's efforts. It's obviously one of the primary goals of the SIG to promote uh, the considerations and, and safety of medical 3D printing, and we hope this webinar will help educate further. Uh, today's format will include each panelist giving some introductory comments, and then we will move to a Q&A session. Uh, we'll have some questions uh, that we've we've come up with, and we'll also take your questions uh, live. So uh, please submit your questions through the Q&A tab in WebEx. So with that, um, I'll now move on to introduce our first panelist, uh, John Wozinski. Uh, John is the uh, executive director of America Makes. Uh, John was appointed executive director on June 2019. Uh, prior to this role, John was technology director responsible for the facilitation of the National Additive Manufacturing and 3D Printing Roadmap, uh, the development of an intellectual property management plan, and the execution 
of the project call process for agency-driven and cooperative agreement-driven project solicitations and program management of the America Makes project portfolio. So we will, John, turn it over to you to uh, grab the screen for a few minutes. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. So hopefully you can see my screen here. Yep. Okay, sorry, I'm just trying to make sure it all works. Um, so thank you, uh, appreciate the opportunity. I'm just going to talk a little bit about what we've been up to, how we got started in this, maybe a little bit of who we are since uh, some of the folks uh, very well may not know of us or, or what we are all about. So the America Makes is the National Additive Manufacturing Innovation Institute. And, and overall, we're really in place and have been working for the past um, seven years plus on trying to organize and, and con convene the additive manufacturing community. So this response uh, or our response relative to COVID um, felt like something we just had to do. We we are a membership driven organization. We have a couple hundred different members from across all types of industries as well as academia, government, et cetera. And everyone was trying to contribute in some way. And I think we were trying to better understand how do we help organize that contribution. So one of the things that we did in order to support that is is kind of pull together or reach out to some of the folks that we'd worked with in the past uh, represented here on the phone today. But we really were focusing on how do we, you know, do three major things, communicate, convene and coordinate the additive manufacturing industry. Um, you know, our, our response we've characterized as something called advanced manufacturing crisis production response, but ultimately it has been put in place to try to ensure that safe and effective products have been and are able to be produced by manufacturers who want to contribute and, and deliver those to the right people at the right time. So we are just for uh, overall awareness, part of a, a network of innovation institutes in the country. Uh, there's 14 different manufacturing USA institutes within that network, each focused on a different um, advanced manufacturing technology. Obviously we're focused on additive manufacturing or 3D printing. Uh, we are we are run through a program office in the Department of Defense, and we were able to receive some initial funding to get this effort started by the Office of Secretary of Defense to to really get everything started. Um, the COVID response in general is is very similar to our overall mission of of bringing the community together around a problem. So there's a simple graphic in the upper right hand corner there where you'll see. Um, the program, which really talks about bringing together the manufacturing design and healthcare communities together around a problem and deliver a, a service of trusted designs that manufacturers could produce for folks in the healthcare community. So we'll talk a little bit more about that here. Get my slide to advance. Um, you know, our, our, the current state of where we're at. We've been very actively working with the others on the phone for, I guess this is our ninth week we've determined um, as of our, our calls at the beginning of this week. We've developed a portal, um, a repository and portal, and have, you know, I think the, the primary or the, the main activity that's taken place is really the connection of all of our organizations. And we'll, we'll talk more about that over the, the coming hour. Um, we have, through the system, Creating an opportunity where manufacturers can go out, post their capabilities, align a capability to a trusted design. You know, we've got hundreds and hundreds of manufacturers included within the system and the capability to produce, you know, hundreds of thousands of units um, additively manufactured against these trusted designs. So just a, a quick overview on how it all works. We have um, you know, as I mentioned, are working with the design needs and manufacturing community, but all of it really is very dependent on what, what we see over on the right hand side of this screen. And, and we'll probably talk a little bit more about this over the course of the next hour. 
Um, but but it's really these three government organizations that are making this all happen. You know, there there is a trusted design repository created and housed at NIH. Um, the VA is playing the role of preliminary uh, evaluation and testing against protocols. And ultimately, the FDA is helping provide some oversight to our, our team of organizations to make sure that we're working on the right things. You know, all of this is really focused again on making sure the public has the right information that they need in order to make good decisions in an attempt to further communicate. And, and that's really what we as a public private partnership are really focused on is how do we bring together the government community and the manufacturing community to be working on the next right thing. So, you know, that's really what we focused on. Everything's been moving so quickly. We just have to make sure we're we're doing the best we can and working on the next right thing. So one of the tools that was put together was a, a simple um, regulatory and performance considerations document. All of this information is posted out on our website. And, and here you can see different product types and what, and this is just a, a small subset of that information, but what are the considerations that a manufacturer needs to be aware of? when producing a good. And I'll close out here. I know we're, we're trying to keep these pretty short. Um, the, the last piece I want to talk about is a prioritization framework. So one thing that we've noticed is, you know, everyone wants to help. Um, we want to make sure that people are helping in the right and, and best manner uh, so we can focus the design community so we're not producing, you know, the 50th and 60th iteration of something that we've already proven, but instead are shifting the focus of that community to the right item. So here we've put together a, a process for prioritization, looking at demand, looking at process, looking at regulatory considerations, and, and then identify top tiers of priority. So I'll, I'll kind of close out um, with that, and then we'll look forward to any questions as we move forward. Perfect. Thank you, John. Our next panel member is Dr. Megan McCarthy. She is the program lead for 3D printing and biovisualization at the Office of Cyber Infrastructure and Computational Biology at the National Institutes of Health and Infectious Diseases, which is part of the NIH. Dr. McCarthy is co-founder and current lead for the NIH 3D Print Exchange. Her work also encompasses a range of projects related to the development and adoption of 3D printing and VR, AR for bioscientific and medical applications, including enhanced 3D visualization of molecular models, medical imaging data, and large-scale multidimensional data sets. Thanks, Pete. I'm just going to um, try and share my screen now. And let's go here. And there we are. Are we ready? Can you guys see this? Yes. Perfect. Great. So um, I've um, participated with the, the SIG the last couple of years, so some of you may know me, some of you may not. Um, but just briefly, the, the NIH 3D Print Exchange is an open repository for sharing free 3D models related to um, 3D printing and bioscience and medicine. And that was launched in 2014, so we have um, you know, models related to um, molecular models, medical models, and then as well, open hardware customized for the laboratory. And just to give you some, some relevance to, to our involvement is not only are we part of NIH, but we're uh, part of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, which makes um, this effort really relevant as, you know, our institute has had a very all hands-on response to this COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so a little bit about the MOU that um, we formed with the FDA, uh, NIAID, and the VA, and America Meets is that we, we came together, and this was 
um, we want to highlight the really rapid response for this that, you know, I think our conversations among the four groups, we started around like March 18th, 19th and um, have had calls, daily calls every day since then. Um, and that we got this MOU together and published within um, uh, five to six days. So um, it's, it's really, we're really kind of, uh, I just wanna highlight, you know, how rapidly that came together and how important it is that we've taken all these four groups to, to do this when we would not have been able to do it otherwise. So the site um, is available for people to find and share 3D printable designs for PPE and medical devices. Um, here's the URL where you can find that and we're giving updates on, on events uh, such, as, such as today. So I'd encourage you to go there and look at some of those resources that we have in addition to the models. The designs are um, assessed by the VA and put into different categories automatically they're they're assigned as a prototype um i think greg is going to talk a little bit more about the the testing process won't go into that much but we're trying to give people this this does not correlate to um fda class one class two um any of those more kind of um those those official designations this is sort of how we're trying to communicate this to people who are wanting to get involved and uh, contribute whether they are manufacturers in industry or they are you know, people in the um, open source hardware community. Um, and the, the clinically reviewed, the, the community use are kind of things that are just sort of low risk. They, they have good instructions, um, but they shouldn't be used in a clinical setting, whereas the clinically reviewed have been tested by the VA um, in their hospitals, they're documented, they're, um, you know, having people upload an instruction for use document. And we really want to indicate that if, if you're going to use those, they absolutely must be fabricated as described with the printer type and materials rather than, you know, take this design, go ahead and print it in PLA in your desktop printer, um, you know, so uh, which may be the case for some of them. But um, for the most part, uh, you, you know, we want to make sure that those printer parameters and materials are as instructed. We also have categories for um, future use as devices go into the process of um, not having an FDA blanket you, you, emergency use authorization, which would apply to, to many of the devices there like face shields and face masks but things that require that are specific devices require their own EUA um, and then have a specific FDA um, approval or um, an e EUA. So the, we've, we've had a great response to the site. Here's some of our stats. We, it was a dramatic increase in our usual, um, you know, user hits. We've had over 200,000 views of the collection page. 524 designs have been contributed. The VA is making uh, an enormous effort to print all of those and really making sure that these that are that have been assessed are really kind of the cream of the crop and being designated as such. And together of those 524 published designs, there's a collective um, uh, total views of over 1 million. People are interacting by uploading pictures of their prints and commenting on things. Um, we've also just recently published a, um, a, a comment in Nature Reviews Materials with some co-authors at University of Southern California, if anyone is interested in checking that out. Sorry, I've left out the link. Um, and so I'll finish up there. We can address the rest in questions, but just want to thank everyone on our dream team on these daily 10 a.m. calls the last nine, nine weeks and um, uh, our development team and anyone who has contributed and also recognize um, work being done by NASA to help us gather information on material safety as well as the Department of Defense for um, creating technical data packages and obviously America Makes has been a, a huge role in engaging them. Uh, and then actually I'll just mention um, Beth Ripley from the VA has a Grammy Award and uh, I've just highlighted that she's next to her own very dear Dr. Fauci. Thanks.
Thanks, Megan. Uh, that was great. A good overview there. Um, we're now going to jo uh, joining us next is Gregory Voss. Uh, Greg is a mechanical engineer at the Minneapolis VA healthcare system uh, in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and in the Minneapolis uh, Adaptive Design and Engineering program called MADE. Uh, prior to joining MADE program, Mr. Voss spent 25 years in the medical device industry, primarily in medical device startups. His experience includes development of FDA class two and three uh, electromechanical devices, operations and quality systems management. Uh, Greg, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. All right, can you see the screen? Yes, we can. So, uh, first, thank you for uh, inviting me on. And so, we're going to talk a little bit about the VA assessment activities on the NIH 3D printing exchange. And as, as Megan talked, there was, there's, five, there's over 500 total submissions. We currently have 173 designs in the 3D printing network that are going, that have either gone through or undergoing a review process. Uh, of those, We've got 51 that, that were that we call on ice. So those are devices that we either we either could not print or couldn't get a response on an IFU or were redundant if there were if there were multiple submissions of the same same idea. Uh, we currently have 36 devices in what we'll what we'll term medical review, 33 devices in the triage, uh, 33 devices that have gone through either the community use review. It have been been checked with the uh, the community use symbol, or gone through the medical review and have been uh, checked with the uh, clinician's use symbol. Uh, we we have twelve that are that are kind of we're waiting on uh, updates from the designer. So things that we have had questions on. So the design looks good, but we either we're missing some information. And then eight that are still in community review. And if we look at the devices that that have gone through, you know, it's primarily masks and face shields. There's some accessories and the other, which I believe is uh, uh, ear sapers, which are an incredibly uh, uh, popular item in terms of uh, in terms of our clinicians in, in the Minneapolis VA. So it, I'm going to start by saying that you know, what, what we're attempting to do, and I've just thrown up one of the guidance documents, is, that the FDA has put out, but what we're attempting to do in our evaluations or our assessments is kind of hew as closely as we can to existing guidance documents that are put out. So I, I'm uh, on the FDA website daily looking for updates on guidance documents. It is a it's it's astounding to see how fast things are happening there from the outside. I can only imagine what's going on on the inside. So if we look at kind of a, an overview of our process, so devices or designs are submitted to us. They go to a triage team in the 3D printing network. That triage team uh, takes those designs, will print it, read the read the accompanying information, and and make one of four determinations. You know, is this thing the same as something we've already seen? Do we need more information to process it? Should this go into a community review bucket? Or into a medical review bucket. And it, once it goes down, once they've made that initial triage, uh, I'm in the medical review team. What we'll do is, is we'll review in things that we've uh, assessed uh, in past that assessment, get assigned the, uh, the clinician check. Uh, the other side is the community review side, things that go through their process and get assessed uh, end up with the uh, community review check. So when we talk about Kind of medical review. It's, it's we're performing it with a multidisciplinary team. So we have a, we have some clinicians, we have uh, some three D printing experts, and we have some regulatory knowledge. And we ask ourselves a few basic questions. You know, can we print the design inside of the, the, the FVA's three D printing network? We have a multitude of printers, so we can assign it to to different locations inside the VA. To, print and send to the Minneapolis VA where we do the assessments. Uh, 
the second one is, do we have enough information to fabricate the non-3D printed components? A lot of these designs, uh, in particular face shields, have non-3D printed components to them. So we want to see, do we have enough information to build those? Uh, then, we'll, then we'll look at the IFU. Can we understand the IFU, or is it understandable by the intended audience? So that is generally done by the cl clinical side, uh, either, uh, either a, a oral surgeon or a nurse manager. So then we start getting down kind of into the more if we break those are done for everything. And then the next step of the review is we're starting to look at device specific things. So we'll look at the intended use and start thinking about characteristics that may affect the performance. We're gonna we're gonna try to identify hazards that, are, that the design is intended to protect against and try to identify use scenarios that the design needs to function in. I'm going to go through a, a brief example. Uh, so this is the uh, uh, a face shield. So we would look at, at this face shield. We would do those first items. So should, can we print it? Can we fabricate the three D non three D printed components? Is the IFU understandable? And then we'll start looking at you know is there a guidance document? Yes, there is. You know, is there a product code for this type of product? Yes, there is. Are there consensus standards that might guide us on how we would evaluate this? Uh, in this case, there are consensus standards for that product code, but none that we felt fit this particular device very well. So we'll review for intended use, kind of re review hazards. Uh, so you re identify use cases. We'll create a test plan. In this case, we we said that you know this device is intended to keep people from getting a direct splatter. So that's what it has to do. And then some of the use cases we identified are like it has to be taken on, it has to be, be able to take it on, take it off. It can't fall off when you're in normal motion. So we develop tests to test for those types of cases. Maybe as simple as just taking it on and off 10 times. Uh, run those tests and then record them and then uh, and, uh, go down to the NIH website and, and click on reviewed for medical use. And that, that is all I have for prepared remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. We will move on to our last presenter and panelist. Uh, our last panelist is Dr. Matthew DePrima. He received his bachelor's in material science and engineering from Rice University and his doctorate in material science and engineering from Georgia Tech. Since 2010, he has been working as a research material scientist at the Center for Devices and Radiologic Health in the FDA. He is co-chair of the Advanced Manufacturing Technologies Working Group, which is spearheading efforts across the agency to address how, added, how advanced manufacturing technologies affect medical regulated product, products and is the chair of the CDRH Additive Manufacturing Working Group, which is leading the effort across the center on how additive manufacturing affects medical device performance. I will turn this over to Matthew, and I will have him go over some of the available resources the FDA currently has online for everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Leah Corris. Uh, so this is Dr. Matthew DePrima from the Food and Drug Administration, and uh, in very short time, these were the resources I was able to publicly share with everyone. So the first uh, resource I want to point to is the Memorandum of Understanding that supports the effort that we've been talking about, and it does a really good job of explaining what each of the uh, organization's uh, responsibilities are and the overall goals of the group. And I think it's really important to stress that from a regulatory perspective, you know, the kinds of products we're looking at are all what the FDA would consider legally marketed products. So these are products that don't need to come to the FDA in a pre-market sense. So there is no FDA clearance or approval process for them, but we felt it was still necessary to let people know that you know, there are some design, there are these designs that have been vetted through some either bench or clinical assessments. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about emergency use authorizations. 
Uh, the FDA has a website available for all the COVID related EUAs. And it's very important to note it, for me to note that many of these are living documents. And as products receive emergency use authorizations, uh, a lot of these documents are amended. So you have to uh, visit, you know, probably daily to make sure you know, you're aware of any changes, but they list out both the products that have been authorized. And in a few cases, the FDA has authored what we call blanket emergency use authorizations, which means that any product, excuse me, <coughs> uh, that meet those requirements automatically have, uh, are covered by that EUA. Uh, we've also been issuing a number of COVID related guidances. Uh, we've issued four this week. So when I say we've been doing about one a day, we're actually uh, doing a little bit better right now. Um, and again, we're also updating those guidances as, uh, uh, as, as needed. Uh, the most important update to the work we've been doing is the original guidance for face masks uh, didn't cover face shields. Uh, the FDA then revised uh, that guidance document to include information on face shields. Um, and then very early on in the COVID response, uh, the FDA released uh, some FAQs of 3D printing of medical devices during the re response. Uh, that has a lot of very general information talking to people about you know, the high level concerns. And I think a lot of the guidances as well as the work through the MOU have done a great job of fleshing out uh, those concerns. Thank you, Pete. All right, thank you, Matthew. And now what we're going to do is we are going to ask some questions and open this up to audience questions. So if the audience will start writing their questions down in the question and answer section, we will start the question process. So for the first question, I'll ask that. Uh, so 3D printing is seen as a stopgap for many of these items because of the traditional supply chain shortages. Can we talk to the fit for 3D printing versus injection molding uh, for short and long-term production of these needed devices? Would anyone like to take a shot at that question? Sure, I'll, I'll take a, a shot. This is uh, John from America Make. So I think we're seeing additive be used in a variety of ways right now to combat the fight. You know, we, we've seen it in the rapid retooling of conventional manufacturing lines, uh, whether it's through prototyping or through the actual, you know, rough fabrication of tools that are then finished machined. Uh, we also see it in, in kind of the, the term that's been regularly used, um, referencing what you asked, uh, is bridge production. So between the time when this, the conventional supply chain can catch up with the traditional, or excuse me, with the, the need, additives filled a very critical role in bridging production. Um, and then there's also, you know, places where we're seeing additive, you know, or we're investigating, I guess, where additive has the potential to make, you know, contributions in, in unique solutions that we otherwise, you know, didn't have before us today. So I think if if I heard your question properly, you know, additives fit the fight, you know, fit in the fight against COVID in a variety of ways. Um, in, in some cases, you know, we're seeing additive be utilized and then transition away because it no longer makes financial sense to do or the rate at which we can manufacture doesn't make sense anymore. Um, but I think we're seeing it being coupled very nicely with conventional manufacturing where we're able to introduce and, as I mentioned, retool lines much more quickly. Um, or, or iterate on, on prototypes much more quickly than we would otherwise. And we saw a couple of good examples of that, even in the, the items that were submitted to the NIH site, where they initially produced them with uh, as printed components and then transitioned to 
prototyping for injection molding and then they're they're finally you know now at the point where they've retooled a line to the point that they're producing them with injection molding so i think like anything it, it really depends on the business case and the you know the need at the time um we're, we're seeing you know, we all know additive plays particular roles and in some cases it doesn't um because of financial uh, or maybe speed is is the bigger concern um, however, there's also some pretty interesting solutions that, you know, have come out and have been additively produced that, you know, may have the potential to, to push aside the conventional process. So I think the, the jury's out, um, but it will ultimately be a case by case basis of, of where, um, additive fits in and, and, and probably most importantly, when it fits in. Uh, but we certainly saw it play a major role in the fight to date in added or in uh, the COVID response. I, I would second that that you know it's primarily you can rapidly iterate and then as a bridge on at least on high volume items a bridge to get you to a point where you can the traditional manufacturing can catch up. That's good. Uh, this is Andy. I, I'll, uh, I'll ask the next question to the group. Um, many of the designs are approved for low risk items such as face shields. Can you talk to the challenges of using 3D printing for higher risk items like N95 respirators? Sure. Uh, this is Matthew Deprema, FDA. So. You know, N95 respirators are still very much being regulated by um, NIOSH and FDA. So I think the challenge is less on the printing side and more on the testing side. And, you know, as uh, with the face masks, especially right now, there are very few good options to print your filter material. So at the end of the day, you're printing you know, the, the mask shell, and then you still have to incorporate the filter material into that design. So I think for some of the higher risk, more regulated products, uh, you, you're seeing that the 3D printing solution is only part of the sort of process, and the other parts are a greater limiting factor. Now, specifically for you know, this MOU, uh, N95s would certainly sort of exceed the mandate since those are still being regulated through uh, NIOSH or the FDA based off of the labeling claims. That's good. Anybody else care to add to that? Uh, moving on, here's a, this is a question, uh, John, this is a question for you. Can you talk to the matchmaking element of this project and how you play a role connecting um, groups like hospitals and healthcare workers with manufacturers that, um, that can produce these devices in quantity? Um, have you talked a little bit about how that works and what are some of the challenges you've seen in, in doing that? Yep, absolutely. So we have, you know, through interactions with the, you know all sides of the community manufacturing and the needs community you know it was quickly identified that a lot of people wanted to help but didn't know how or where to help so this this system that we had built through the portal that exists on america makes.us is is really trying to directly address that so we have uh, early on we we you know just ask people to up, update their profiles or create even a profile and, and, and express ways in which you could contribute. Um, that proved to be extremely difficult to try to match up with somebody because it, there's just not enough completeness to profiles. Uh, we very quickly iterated and directly hooked into the NIH site. So now if you were to go to the site and, and log in and create a profile as a manufacturer, you would go in and, and identify as being capable to produce a specific design. So if you have the processes in place to produce face shields, you could identify the very specific face shields, and we only allow them to select those that have been reviewed by the VA. So 
Manufacturers will flag and identify what they can produce and what capacities per week they can produce. On the other side of it, from the manufacturer um, healthcare point of need um, folks, they, they do something similar where they go in and, and identify if I need a face shield, if there's one in particular that I've you know received and, and, and want to continue to receive, they can pick that at a certain volume or they can pick if they don't really care, it's just about I need face shields, um, you know, pick all the designs that are acceptable. They're presented very, you know, simplistically to a user. And then when we get a request from a healthcare uh, or from a point of need facility, we then go in and look at from that base of manufacturers who's you know most uh, close to them. So we're really looking at it from a regional point of view. We try to identify a handful so they're not overwhelmed by options and hand those over to the healthcare provider and and provide that as a resource to them. Ultimately, it's their responsibility to go out and connect with the manufacturers uh, we then you know follow up repeatedly to make sure they're getting what they need if there's anything if their need wasn't specifically met you know we try to assist more uh, we're not in the transactional side of things so we're not actually you know asking manufacturer a to produce 10,000 units of item you know 013489 and deliver it to this person for a particular price that all ultimately the transaction happens between the producer and the person with the need, but we're enabling the connections. The important thing to note is that it's all based off of the NIH data though. So things that have been reviewed and evaluated so that they're ensured that they're receiving product that meet a particular set of standards. John, this is Pete. I have a quick follow-up to that uh, question. Has uh, America Makes done anything to uh, regulate the pricing of these devices? The, the short answer of that would be no. Uh, we we have not. Uh, it actually came up. We had a, a call or an event this past Monday with a number of folks, and that came up a couple of different times. Um, we have, you know, worked with manufacturers and, and have a pretty good understanding of how a number of them are handling things. You know, we know many of them are simply producing product at cost, you know, to try to do their part or, you know, for free or, you know, for in cases, a profit. That's, you know, we, we haven't chosen to get involved with trying to regulate that in any way. Uh, we have been talking to them, trying to get an understanding, you know, from the the business case side of it to you know ultimately are these products being produced at a cost that is acceptable to the community um so so we have talked to many folks about it uh, but we've not tried to get in the middle of what somebody should be charging or could be charging for a product produced we haven't heard of any direct issues or concerns from the point of need facilities, uh, but I, I wouldn't suggest that our sample size is, you know, huge or anything there. Um, but we've we've not directly addressed that. That's good. Um, I'll take um, and maybe Pete pull a question from the audience. Um, there's a question here um, about um, nasal swabs and. Um, and the comment is, could someone comment on whether 3D printed swabs are able to be evaluated and tested to the point of green check status uh, with proper IFUs, the group could, can the group clinically validate nasal pharyngeal swabs? There are two swabs on the NIH site today with warnings. So maybe that's for, for you, Greg or Matthew. Uh, this is Matthew. I'll go first. Uh, Right now, I don't think there's any limitations for nasal pharyngeal swabs going through the MOU. Um, I believe very shortly, if the FDA hasn't already done this, uh, we're going to be announcing a call later this week to discuss nasal pharyngeal swabs. So I'm going to have to defer any more specifics until after uh, the FDA has uh, had that discussion. 
I don't have very little to add. I, we, what we are doing in the VA currently is is doing maybe some uh, prints to do some evaluation, and that's about it. Just trying to work out process flow and uh, things of that nature. If if something were to happen, so basically prepar preparation. Okay. Good. And I'll just add to that um, briefly that you know the warning that's going on those is you know in. And until the FDA is able to give better um, uh, lowercase g or uppercase g guidance, and we're working on, um, we're actually going to have sort of a, a special banner for the nasal swabs because they, they kind of have their own implications with them. And uh, in addition, putting up some resources and, and, and links to, to different initiatives related to the nasal swab printing. Okay. I think that'll be uh, it'll continue to be a popular topic. Um, Megan, another question for you, um, just uh, switching topics a little bit relating to the scope of applications and the scope of designs. There's obviously a lot of, uh, it seems like face shields are probably the most popular design um, in terms of things that people are uh, uh, downloading and printing. What, 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 other, what other things are most popular that you've seen through the site? I think, yeah, it's, it's, there's a lot of face shields, a lot of ear savers. Um, and actually I should have, have broken that down. I'd have to, I'd have to go back and look and see exactly what the, the percentage makeup is for each of those uh, different device categories. Um, I think, I think the one with the most hits on there is an ear saver followed by the VA's top gap mask um, and then another face shield. The, there are some kind of ventilator parts and other devices there, um, including those two nasal swabs. Um, but yeah, really the, the face shields have been the, the overwhelming uh, contribution. Thank you. I have a question for Greg. Uh, Greg, uh, we've seen an influx of models into the NIH print exchange. There's over 500 designs. How, how do you really prioritize all of these of what to actually print and then test? Sure, that's a, that's a pretty easy one. So we're looking at a combination of risk and need. So items, as we look at things, we'll score them a couple different ways. Items that score high on perceived need and low on perceived risk are prioritized because we can they have a big impact and don't take a lot of time to clear through. I've got a I've got a question here, maybe for the group, um, and, and maybe yeah, it could be John or it could be any of you. Can you talk to intellectual property in this framework? Um, I understand that the designs are open source, but are our companies, uh, let's say, for profit or non profit companies, able to take those designs, produce them locally, and sell them with or without profit? Is there any any discussion about intellectual property you'd care to? Sure. I'll let you take that one, Megan, if you want, since, I mean, maybe cover the, uh, the process of what the folks who post designs walk through, and then if there's more detail we can fill in. Sure, yeah, I was trying to um, hop in there and unmute myself. So, so yes, people when they, they upload a design can uh, apply a license to that. If it's something that is patented, they're able to, um, you know, give some kind of disclaimer there on how they want it to be used. If it is, you know, they can provide other, uh, attach another open license like um, uh, uh, BSB or Creative Commons. The, the idea with the intellectual property is really that, um, uh, you know, if you indicate, it, so say things like the, the face shield that's really popular, they've said on their website, they're making it open, but, you know, please don't produce this for a massive profit, you know, kind of like, look, let's all be good actors in this and, and contribute for it at the time of emergency. There, I have seen a few that have a non-commercial use license applied. So I think anyone going to make these would want to just be be conscious of that 
and you can certainly reach out to the user and say, hey, here's my plan, here's what I'd like to do, um, you know, is that okay? And, and get permission uh, specifically for that. Okay. John, anything to add or does that seem to cover us? Yeah, no, I think, think that covers it. I mean, what we are seeing, I think, you know, if we look beyond and look into some uh, different types of components, you know, that, that becomes more complex. You know, how do we, what, what can and should be shared at, at what level? Um, but the, you know, the vast majority of the items that are out there now, you know, are most everyone's agreed to the same, you know, go forward plan as they've uploaded design. So I think that's about covers it. Okay. Um, there's a question. We'll take a question from the audience here. It ties into another question that I had too, uh, more on the regulatory side. And then the question is, have there been any 3D printed ventilator splitters or BiPAP adapters that have received emergency FDA approval for use? And I wonder, I, I had a question that that ties into Matthew for you about just EUAs, emergency use authorizations in general for individual designs and noticing that there's a category for them through the site, but there aren't actually any listed there. And, and just maybe talking to, are, are those designs more restricted and or how many of those have been, have been approved? All right, well, I'm going to uh, thank Andy for sharing the questions beforehand because I was on the FDA EUA site uh, earlier this morning and for ventilator uh, splitters and accessories, there are two, uh, clearly 3D printed BiPAP adapters that have emergency use authorization both from April of or April 29th. So there are certainly 3D printed products that have EUAs. I, in the early days of putting this MOU, we were expecting that there would be more open source EUAs for 3D printed products. So we wanted to make sure that there was that avenue available on the print exchange that would require and uh, someone submitting an EUA to sort of want to make it open source. And if someone doesn't want to make the EUA open source, there's less of an incentive for them to come to the uh, 3D print exchange. So this was an option we wanted to have the capacity for. And to date, we haven't seen anyone want to upload an e their own uh, EUA product to the print exchange. And that could be for a number of business or regulatory reasons. Okay, thank you. Andy, I'd, I'd like to add with regard to the um, you know, things like ventilator splitters, they have that warning there. We had um, you know a lot of in internal discussions about you know, should we host those? What are the safety implications? And, you know, there are concerns within the clinical, uh, you know, within many communities, especially the medical community, as, as most of you in that community would be aware on, you know, using a ventilator splitter for, you know, two or more patients. The, the, what the perspective from the NIH is, is that they, the 3D designs themselves do not carry a risk and that, you know, they should be out there, they can be shared, people, you know, may kind of um, be able to develop something out of that, whether or not they're, you, you know, actually printing it. Um, and that, you know, it's all kind of use at your own risk, but recognizing that we do have users across the globe that, you know, may be, you know, that are not subject to the same regulations uh, and that may be able, you know, in, in more desperate times, be able to, to take advantage of those. So we've tried to make it clear kind of with that, that warning, like it's very much proceed at your own, at your own risk, but, but we thought the files themselves, um, you know, are, are fine to have there. And uh, I just saw a comment from someone that they're making their files available. Uh, I think it's really worth, again, pushing the, this MOU and the 3D print exchange is completely voluntary. Right? No one, no one's required to use it for anything. It's just, uh, you know, a resource we wanted to provide to the community. Good, thank you. Um, 
There's another, I'll take another audience question here, um, which ties into one that I had also, which the audience question is, how do each of you imagine this will impact the future implementation and pipeline for 3D printed devices? Tying into maybe just a little bit more, there are examples where 3D printing is a long-term fit for production of these COVID-19 related devices. Anybody have a comment? Well, I think all of us are hoping that there's not a lot of long-term COVID uh, things that we have to worry about. Uh, I think there's going to be a really interesting intersection when we start looking at point of care printing and manufacturing, which was sort of you know, what the topic of this was sort of originally billed at, is you know when you have hospitals with this capacity, and you know FDA has already talked about some frameworks for hospitals to do this, right? there's someone still needs to design what you're printing and generally do some risk assessment so it's quite possible for what we'll call sort of minimal risk products that a hospital could print at the point of care you know this may be a worthwhile resource for everyone to maintain to sort of reduce the need to design and test products sort of individually and have a again a trusted repository of product, of designs that you know have been shown to work. Yeah, I think the biggest impact will be that we have a repository of designs that have been undergone, undergone some form of assessment, and they're there on the shelf and ready to be taken down if necessary and used. I would like to ask a follow up question to that, and that's a. Uh, if a hospital was in the process of examining a device to implement uh, from the NIH print exchange, how would you go about instructing them on choosing the right device that's been reviewed for clinical use uh, from all the different items that uh, are up there? It, it, for me, it would depend upon kind of the type of device. I would get a team together with some different uh, Different disciplines to take a look at it. You know, somebody at least from 3D printing says, "Yes, I can print this easily." Somebody from you know, either occupational health, if it's a PPE piece of equipment, maybe infectious disease, and then maybe a specialty or a nurse manager would kind of take a look at all of the different designs and then score them. And um, I'll I'll add to that, Pete. The um you know those the ones for clinical use are have a designated printer type of material with them so you need to see okay well what can i actually print that i have the equipment to do so um and we are encouraging people to upload build files so you know um if it's an hp or a four months or a stratasys printer or whatever if, if there are um any kind of proprietary file types or if it's just g code um that you would be, that 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 could be uploaded so that the user can actually take that instead of taking your stl and having to slice it or orient it whatever way um you know it seems to be right for for you if you can take the build file and just put that directly into your printer there's a much um higher level of trust that the uh that the product you get will be what is intended Perfect. Thank you. Um, we are rounding out the hour here, so I think, unfortunately, we have to wrap this up, and we have so many more questions I would love answered, but we're out of time. Um, so, first of all, I would like to thank these four institutions for getting together so rapidly to produce this uh, collaboration. This is a heroic effort that they've undertaken. Uh, I want to thank RSNA and the SIG members, the SIG Leadership Committee, for helping to put on this webinar. I want to extend a special thanks to all our panel members for taking time out of their busy schedules to educate us on their collaborative effort. Please stay safe, social distance, practice good hygiene, and print safe. Thanks for attending. <laughs>